We are live on the air. NEC Men's Basketball Google Hangout brought to you by Geico. Today's NEC Google Hangout brought to you by Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car, on car insurance. Please visit geico.com. Today I am joined by one of uh, my favorite bloggers out there. This guy knows his stuff, trust me. There's not many people who know their NEC Men's Basketball better than Ryan Peters. He's part of the growing Big Apple Buckets franchise. You can find his writing, strangely enough, not at BigAppleBuckets.com. They are at NYCBuckets.com. Uh, Ryan can also, uh, he's a frequent tweeter, uh, at Pioneer underscore Pride. Uh, check out his site. Ryan and the founder of the site, John Templon, do a fantastic job, not only covering NEC hoops, but mid-major hoops in general. Uh, Ryan, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm at my home studio tonight. I'm not in my usual, uh, my lair at the NEC compound in Somerset. So, um, but I'm still excited to join you. We have 24 hours or less now until we begin the NEC men's hoop season in earnest conference play beginning. And I'm very happy that you have uh, given up some of your time to join us. Uh, thanks for having me, Ron. I'm, I'm thrilled to, to talk NEC hoops with you and can't wait for the games tomorrow night. Well, we are here. It has been uh, two months of non-conference play. Uh, lots of great performances. Uh, lots of players um, have stepped up, and lots of teams have surprised in that time. So I wanted to go through some of that stuff with you, Ryan. Let's start first with the individuals. Let's go with two months' worth of non-conference performances. What is your non-conference, all-conference team? Well, you know, we, we just published a, a post uh, yesterday with our one of my favorite posts to write, midseason, uh, first team and second team, all NEC, and there were a lot of point guards on the teams. Uh, you know, Jason Brickman, we all know how good he is. You know, he, he has a chance to become the fourth player in NCAA history to, to get 1,000 career assists, which is remarkable in its own right. Julian Norfleet's having an incredible season at, at Mount St. Mary's, averaging close to 20 points, six rebounds a game. Um, and then you got to talk about Sidney Sanders. He's having kind of a season that just came out of nowhere, you know, under Greg Horenda. He's been a godsend for him. Uh, he's just playing terrific basketball, scoring the basketball, protecting it. You know, those are the three guys right now that I think are the, the top performers in the league, and coincidentally, they're all point guards. Right. So uh, we know about, I mean, Jason Brigman is known quantity. We know what he's done and what he means to LIU. Um, Sidney Sanders, though, I think is one of the great stories in the league. Uh, last year, he came in off the bench. He was a pretty good backup point guard, averaged four points a game. Has improved that average by more than, I think, 15 points a game. He's averaging 19 a game this year. And uh, has led FDU to some some big, big wins uh, in the non-conference portion of the schedule. Um, not something you expected, was it? No, not at all. Um... You know, I, I went to I went to FDU's practice in the uh, the preseason, and I was asking Greg, you know, is there anyone on this team that you think could step up? And he, in October, had really no idea who that guy was going to be. He didn't know if it was going to be Sidney, uh, Matthias, or a bunch of other guys. Whether you're talking about Mustafa Jones, but Sidney has really stepped up and played well. You know, you mentioned he he's his points per game is up to 19, 19.6 per game. You know, he's averaging close to five assists a game. The big thing with him is he's actually he's been a lot more aggressive this year. He's getting to the free throw line a ton, and that's where he's generating a lot of the scoring from. All right, so give me your five. Who are your – give me one to five. No particular order. Give me your all-conference first team right now. All-conference first team, Jason Brickman, of course, Julie Norfleet, Carvel Anderson, probably the most efficient scorer in the league right now, you know, shooting 45% from behind the arc. I like him on my first team. And then two power forwards that we knew are, are terrific players. He, you could pretty much put him down for uh, averaging, you know, 15 points and eight rebounds a game, and that's Alex Francis and Jalen Cannon. That's a pretty good five, but wait a minute. You just spent all this time talking about Sidney Sanders. Okay. Where is Sidney? What's going on here? Sidney is the if, – if I, if I could put six guys in the first team, I'd put <laughs> Sidney on there. I think there was too many point guards in the first team, so I had to – you know, no disrespect to Sydney, but I think uh, Jason and Julian Norfleet are doing a, a little better job than Sydney. Um, but no disrespect to him; he's having a great year. Give me some other guys. If you know, if we were getting onto a second team, who are your next few on? Well, we have Kenny Ortiz. You know, he's 
he's he's been one of the more underrated guys in the league just because the impact he provides on both ends of the both sides of the ball. You know, he's, he's terrific on the ball defender. Um, very good at managing a game. You know, he's not going to put up gaudy statistics, but he does a good job running that offense. Deami Starks, you know, the leading scorer in the NEC right now, he probably will end up doing that by the end of the year, averaging close to 21 points a game. Uh, Lucky Jones, kind of a do-everything forward for Andy Toole. And then finally, Earl Brown. You know, St. Francis had a tough start to the season, but Earl is averaging close to a double-double, 14-10, and 10, which is remarkable, you know, given uh, – you know, the supporting cast around him. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a big Earl Brown fan. I'm glad that you did mention him and the season that he's having. And it's just getting better. His numbers seem to be improving from um, from game to game. And uh, we'll see a lot of him during the conference season. Double, double man almost every night out. Okay, so we went through the all-conference team. Let's move now. Give me your five, the best freshmen, the rookies. Who are they? And there's some good ones this year. There are some good ones. You know, um, the first one that comes to my mind is uh, Daniel Garvin. He kind of came out of nowhere at Bryant. You know, this is a kid who played kind of a lower level competition in high school over at, uh, you know, my neck of the woods, Bethel High School in Connecticut. Super athletic, 6'6 wing. Guy could shoot the three. He could dribble drive. Um, very good defender as well. He's just got to learn to stay on the floor a little bit better, be more disciplined. But he's right now my top rookie. But they have plenty of guys behind him that are really talented. You know, Devon Barnett, another really athletic wing for Sacred Heart. He's going to make a lot of noise. He's averaging 10 a game. Jeremiah Wortham, he's a, a highly rated recruit coming in. So we knew he was going to be good, but he's he's produced for Andy Toole so far. Um and then, you know, Wayne, Wayne Martin kind of came out of nowhere for St. Francis, Brooklyn. He's kind of a bulldog in that paint, guy who has a really good block rate. He's crafty around the rim. Uh, he's done a really good job for Glenn Breka. Um, and then the last guy uh, is um, Lee Carmen. He's done a really good job. Basically, Rob Krimmel, the head coach, has asked him to come in and be the starting point guard right from day one. He's handled it perfectly. You know, he's a kid who's averaging nine points, about four rebounds a game. But most impressive with him is he's got an assist to turnover ratio of 2.2. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of his as well. A little known fact, by the way, Wayne Martin went to my high school, Satra High School in Brooklyn. Go Vikings. Um, <laughs> he's, done a, he's done a great job. And uh, I agree. I think that the uh, freshman class is, is something that, you know, um, we're building a foundation at some of these schools with some of the young players. And, you know, I've seen Dan Garvin play a bunch of times too. And I saw him play Madison Square Garden. And um, he's got ups. He's got some length. Uh, he disrupts defensively. I like him a lot. I think he's going to be a really good one in this league for, for the next three years after this year. Um, let's go now to underrated. Now, going into the season, I think we were all in agreement that Julian Norfleet was underrated. I don't know if he's underrated anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. Give me yeah. your guys this year that deserve more uh, more PR. One guy, the first guy I think of naturally is Corey Maynard. You know, this is a guy, and, you know, I, I'm going a little back here. He reminds me a little bit of Drew Schubick at Sacred Heart back in the day because Maynard's kind of a similar player. He was he was a wing guy. He's playing kind of the two and three for Tim O'Shea. And then, you know, you lose Frankie Dobbs to graduation. So O'Shea asked Maynard to come in and play the point guard spot. Much like Dave Bike asked Drew Schubick to come in his senior year and play the point guard spot, and Maynard's been terrific the last seven games. I wrote about it today. You know he's averaging 14 points, four rebounds, close to six assists a game, protecting the basketball, you know, defending. And I love his game too. He's a guy that's going to hustle. He's going to dive, dive on the floor for loose balls. You know, he's he's a player that every team should covet. I agree 100% on your assessment of Maynard. I'm going to throw some other guys, some other underrated guys. I think they're underrated. Maybe you don't agree. That's okay. Um, Marcus Burton. Um, I like Chris Evans, Malcolm yes. McMillan, mm -hmm. Bill Gaetano, and, yep. and, and Corey's teammate, Joe O'Shea, who I think is a really good player too. I agree with all those guys. And, uh, you know, Malcolm McMillan's one of my guys that I don't think anyone really knows about, but he's a guy who's just come in. He's been able to handle the offense. He protects the basketball. And, actually, we're going to get to see what he can do now because he's going to be one of the main guys in that team, you know, unfortunately with Kyle Vinales' injury coming up here. You know, he's a guy that I think is going to be able to step up and score some more points, and then people will start to know, you know, what he could do. And then one other guy who's maybe not necessarily underrated but kind of unknown is Gilbert Parga. Um, you know, he's a guy he's – 
he's had trouble staying healthy in non-conference, but we, when he's been on the floor, he's played eight games so far. He's a guy who's made over half his three-point attempts. He gets to the line on average six times a game, which is quite impressive. And he's a pretty good, pretty good rebounder for a guard, so I think he could be a critical offensive weapon for Jack Perry. Hopefully he could stay healthy, knock on wood. Okay, um, let's move on now. We've talked about the best players, the best rookies, most underrated guys. Give me your pick. Who is the most indispensable player to his team in the NEC right now? Uh, it's pretty easy. That's Jason Brickman. You know, what he means to that team. He's basically playing 39, 40 minutes a game, uh, commanding the offense. You know, he's handling a ton of possessions for Jack Perry. You know, he's a guy that has the best assist rate in the country. So if you take him out of that lineup, I don't know what Jack Perry would do without him. I don't think he wants to think about that. Um, he'd be my number one guy for sure. Yeah, we'll find out next year. Yeah. All right, so I want to talk about the, now the best single game performances of the year, okay? I did, I did my research here. We'll see if you did your research too, what you think. All right, I'm going to give you five performances. You tell me what you think is the most impressive this year, okay? All right, I got to read these now. I can't remember everything. Um, we have Julian Norfleet, 31 points, 10 assists, 11 for 13 shooting in a blowout win over a pretty good Norfolk State team on the road. We had uh, Jason Brickman going for 26 points, 13 assists, 3 steals at Sam Houston. We got Sid Sanders going for 23, 9, and 9 in a win over Seton Hall. Uh, Deami Starks at the Garden, 8 out of 9 threes, 35 points, 8 rebounds. He was, he was cooking that night, I'll tell you. I was there. And... Uh, Earl Brown, 31 points just the other day. 31 points, 11 rebounds, two blocks at NGIT. Is one of these your best performance of the year thus far, or do you have something I missed? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Julian Norfleet. You know, he scored 31 points on 13 shots, and he had 10 assists. He had three rebounds. He had four steals. You know, in terms of efficiency rating, he was by far the best perfor individual performance of the, the young season for the NEC. Another performance that you didn't mention is Earl Kelly, what he did at Holy Cross, where he scored 32 points, he had eight rebounds, uh, three assists, four steals in that game. That was kind of a coming out party for Kelly. You know, he, he was able to dribble, drive, get to the get to the rim, and uh, you know, he was giving the Crusaders a lot of fits in that game. Yeah, he was pretty awesome that game. It's it's it's. I'm sad that he's not stayed healthy this year. I think yeah. a, a healthy Sacred Heart team. Um, could be a sleeper. We'll get to sleepers a little later on, but I'm a big um, I'm a big Kelly fan. I love his game. I am too. Uh, all right, go ahead. You got so, something else on on Evan? No, I'm I, I'm a big fan of Evan too. He's just he's such a versatile player. I mean, he's a guy who could guard the one, two, and three for you. You know, he's a kid who could who could shoot the three. He could drive to the rim. Um, he he's one of the more indispensable players in the league too, in my opinion. And hopefully, you know, his shoulder injury isn't too bad, and hopefully, he could get back to playing uh, in a few games or so. All right, Ryan. Let's go to the team side. We talked about the players during non-conference play during the last eight or nine weeks. What team, in your mind, has exceeded expectations um, heading into league play? That's pretty easy. It's got to be St. Francis of Brooklyn. Um, you know, they did it from the opening night. They knocked off Miami, the ACC. It was only the second time an NEC team had beaten an ACT, ACC team this, this century. Um, so that was pretty impressive. But, you know, it, you know, St. Francis has also a, a, a couple really good under-the-radar wins that I don't think a lot of fans, fans maybe appreciate. You know, they beat a very good Stony Brook team. They beat a very good Canisius team with Billy Barron. Um, you know, those, those are just some of the wins. And, you know, uh, Glenn ba Breaker's team, you know, they're bringing it defensively. They're very athletic. You know, they got a couple shot blockers now to pair around Jalen Cannon. So I think they're a team that definitely exceeded expectations. They were picked – I believe they were they were picked seventh in the preseason poll. Right. right. So let me get um, – what other – were there any other wins this year that uh, you consider big wins? Maybe they were under the radar wins. Maybe they're against teams from leagues that you don't necessarily think is the highest level – but there were some really good teams, uh, and you know. Anyway, yeah. Well, FDU, you know, they 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 knocked off their Jersey rivals, F, uh, Seton Hall and Rutgers, in the same week. I don't think anyone saw that coming. That that was pretty remarkable. And then you, you talked about you know how awesome Sidney Sanders has been. He was a a big reason why they won those games. And then you know Mount St. Mary's, they've been a little up and down in this non-conference, but they have three wins against the Patriot League this year, which is a very good mid-major league. 
Um, and then Wagner, you know, Wagner's been a little inconsistent, but they did beat a, a Vermont team that was favored to win the America East this year. Yeah, I think Wagner's going to be right there when all is said and done. And I love the wins that the Mount has this season. I mean, the three, the wins over at Norfolk against American and against Bucknell, those are good wins. Those yes, are solid are. mid-major teams they beat. And they, you know, you look at some of the teams. We haven't mentioned Robert Morris at all. I mean, Robert Morris has played. A, a, a very difficult schedule, as does the Mount and, and Bryant. And we have all these teams that are playing uh, these tough games, and you know, every once in a while we, we pick some of the bigger teams off. But sometimes it's those mid-major wins, and if you get them on the road, even Sacred Heart, look at their wins. I mean, they won at Fordham. You know, they went to Hofstra and won double digits. You know, double digits at Fordham. So, um, yeah, the consistency may not have been there, but there have been some some real bright moments over the last couple months. True, and then, you know, you look at Bryant. You know, Bryant competed really well in the non-conference. Maybe they don't have the wins on their side, but they, they literally were, and you were there, they were neck and neck with Delaware. They, they could have won that game. They were, beating a, they were beating late in the second half a really good North Dakota State team, a team that's probably going to win the Summit League, in my opinion. They, they have four all-conference guys on that team. They, they were up with about five minutes left in the second half, so they were right there. It's just too bad that they couldn't pull it out, but it is encouraging that they were in those games. And very they also played Notre Dame really into the last couple minutes of that game as well. So uh, that's a tough Bryant team. We all we all knew that. It's it's too bad when I when I think about some of the games I've watched this year, and then nobody's watching more than me. Is the the one that'll stick in my craw is that Syracuse St. Francis game mm -hmm. because they probably had as good a chance to knock Syracuse off over those you know you know through the new year. It's just about anybody. I mean, that game was right there for the taking. And, uh, you know, I, it's, is it shocking that, that Syracuse pulled it together in the final minute? No. But that was, to me, as impressive performance as I saw. And, and even though St. Francis had beaten Miami, I don't know if anyone saw that coming in that game. No, I mean, the Terriers played a wonderful 37 to 38 minutes of that game. It's just too bad they couldn't put it together. But, you know, Syracuse is ridiculously athletic. They're, they're so talented that um, it was only a matter of time before they are going to get it going. But, I mean, that's a testament to how good Glenn Breka's team has been so far this year, the fact that they were leading Syracuse th 37 minutes into the game at the Carrier Dome. It was, it was amazing. Um, let me get back to FDU for a second. Um, obviously, nobody saw this coming this year. I mean, their record is impressive, and, and Greg Horan has made light of the record. Um, but they have some pretty, you know, they have some really good wins. Obviously, beating Rutgers and Seton Hall is no easy task on the road. Where do you, where do you see this? Where does it come from? Is it, you know, Sidney Sanders has been huge, but he's not doing it all by himself. Like, where, where is the turnaround here that you're seeing with the Knights? I think it's just a change of culture. You know, the, the program had been losing so much for the last three, four seasons that, you know, you just needed a, a new guy. You know, Greg Horenda, he's, he's rebuilt programs. Everyone knows how much he, how well he's done at UMass Lowell. Um, you know, so I think it's just kind of a change of culture and kind of getting the kids to buy into his philosophy. You know, he, he's selling fun basketball to them. He's saying, you know, if you play defense, we'll run up and down the floor, you know, his philosophy is, you know, you get a defensive rebound, I want you up the floor in five seconds or less. You know, uh, kids like that. And, you know, he's got – everyone's playing for hard form. He has a deep rotation, so he could he could flip in uh, guys like that. And, you know, he's been able to get a couple recruits in. Mac McDonald's one guy who's who's played pretty well as a freshman. No one really saw that coming. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of it's horrenda, you know, kind of just giving these kids the energy that they needed. Okay, let me also, i got to circle back, because uh, we haven't, again, we haven't talked a lot about Robert Morris, and I, I just, there's something in me that tells me that come the end of February, Robert Morris is going to be right there. Now, their schedule has been, uh, you know, pretty pretty nuts, you know, at this level, who they play and who they play on the road. They still have some good wins in there. I mean, they still, it's not like they went winless. They won five games. I think they're at five wins now. Five, ten, yeah. Um, I look at Carvel Anderson, and I look at Lucky Jones, and Anthony Myers paid, and these guys have been around the block a few times. They've played in the biggest games um, around this league, and I just get the feeling that uh, Andy Toole and those guys are just—it's they're going to hit that, they're going to hit their stride, and they're just going to start building it 
and there's going to be a winning streak in there somewhere along the way, and people are going to go, okay, Bobby Moe's back. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, I think Robert Morris right now, I would be surprised if they're not in the top half of the league at season's end. Because, I mean, how can we bet against Andy Tool? He's got a 39-15 and 15 regular season record career. I mean, that's remarkable. Um, and, you know, the, you talked about their tough non-conference schedule. It was actually the 26th toughest schedule in the, in the country. And, they, you know, in the month of December, they were playing some really good offenses. You know, they're playing Youngstown State, 87th best offense, Toledo third, Oakland 51st, Oklahoma State with Marcus Smart fifth. I mean, they're playing some high-powered offenses. So I think a lot of people see the defensive issues that they've had, but I'm not really too concerned about it. I think Andy Toole is going to figure it out. He's got the athletes in this team. I think the non-conference was all about him just kind of figuring out the rotation and, uh, you know, basically get, getting his seven, eight, maybe nine guys to play and, uh, you know, play hard. Yeah, I mean, you lose a Velton Jones, you lose a Russell Johnson, I mean, two, like, all-timers at Robert Mars. It's never going to be easy to uh, recapture that chemistry the next year. So, you know, maybe Robert Morris is that January, February team that needs to put it all together. Uh, let's go to Wagner for a little bit. We'll get to the contenders. I know we'll be talking about Wagner. Um, I look at that Wagner team. I look at that front line, especially with what Neofal Folahan has, you know, did recently against Monmouth with 10 block shots. Yeah. And then I look at that backcourt. I mean, Kenny Ortiz is like, you know, this, is, this, is, this guy will go down as one of my favorite players who's played in the league. I love guys. I love gritty guys that, that can get it done defensively. And that's what Kenny Ortiz does. He's a leader. Latif Rivers has been around, a great player. Uh, Jay Harris, Juan Anderson starting to pick it up. This team's going to get rolling at some point, right? Yeah, I agree. Um, they're just too deep, too athletic not to be a factor in this league. And, you know, they struggle in the non-conference. Um, you know, you can't dispute that. But in their last game at Monmouth, they won – like a typical Wagner Seahawks team would win. They, they, they ground the game down. They held Mom at the 52 points, 33% shooting from the floor. You know, it was a typical Bashir Mason win, Dan Hurley win, but, you know, two years prior. I, I think they're going to be okay. They're very deep. They have a, a bevy of guards. You know, you talk about Ortiz. Latif Rivers is one of the better scorers in the league. We mentioned Marcus Burton is an underrated guy. He's, he's a wonderful <laughs> asset to have coming off the bench. Um, and then, you know, Dwan Anderson, very athletic. And then they have, you know, Mario Moody, Folahan. They got some young guys, you know, Nolan Long could, could come in and contribute. You know, they're, they're going to be around. They're going to be a factor uh, in the conference for sure. Yeah, I mean, when Moody gets it going, that's a tough team to beat. And they're tough at home. When that crowd, when that place is jammed and their fans are into it, that's a tough home court over there. Yeah, he's a, Moody's a fun player to watch. He's, he's had some uh, rim-shattering dunks. I you know, I was I was actually you know living in Maryland. I was down when they played Coppin State uh, early in the year, and he had about four or five dunks in that second half that brought the crowd to its feet. It was pretty, the athleticism, the fact that he get his elbows up to the uh, to the rim there when he when he's dunking the ball. It's it's pretty incredible, and the team feeds off that energy when he's when he's going. All right, so we've talked about a whole bunch of teams. Let's get to the nitty gritty right now. I want your contenders. Give me your, say, your five, your four, your first four in the standings when we head into the tournament. Don't give me your tournament pick. Give me your first four heading into the tournament. My first four are going to be, uh, you know, Bryant. I think, you know, they're high-powered offense. They've, 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 they've done it last year. You know, they were, they were in the thick of it last year. They finished fourth overall in the regular season. They're going to be around. Wagner's going to be a factor. We talked about them. St. Francis in New York, best defense in the league right now. They'll, they'll be around. And like we said before, I think Andy Toole figures it out. Robert Morris is going to be in that discussion for a home playoff game in the, the postseason NEC tournament. All right, so you named four. Let's throw out a couple more. Can the Mount right now, can the Mount, who's starting to bring it together here, and if you remember last year, they didn't start out like a, like a ball of fire. They, yeah. that, that was a slow, steady surge they made there. Can the Mount get back? Yes, they can. They, they're going to be a little inconsistent because, you know, they're only down to eight scholarship players. So, you know, I think J-Man Christian, you know, and he's trying to do it now. He has to adjust to the Mayhem system. He can't play Mount Mayhem for 40 straight minutes. He just doesn't have the bodies anymore to do that. But he does have the athletic scorers to do that. He's got Julian Norfleet. He's got Rashad Wack, Sam Prescott. He's got a couple freshmen and Will Miller and uh, – 
Byron Ash, who are who when they get going from downtown, they could hit a lot of shots. So this is a team that could score in bunches, and I think if they get hot at the right time, they'll absolutely be a factor. All right, so now, okay, we're up to five teams now. We started with four, we're up to five. I'm going to throw out another one. Let's talk about it. It's amazing that we've been on this thing for 20-something minutes, whatever, and how little we've talked about the three-time defending champions, uh, LIU. Can, is there enough this year? I mean, we, we know what Brickman is going to bring to the team, and we know that there's some pieces around him that are pretty good. Like I'm, I've been pretty impressed with Landon Atterbury, and you already mentioned Gil Parga. Uh, and E.J. Reed was an all-rookie player. Can they get it together for three games in March and go for uh, the soar for four? I guess they could, but I'm not counting on it. I just think that they've been ravaged with injuries. You know, it's 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 a shame that they couldn't have Julian uh, Julian Boyd for you know his fourth and final season. Uh, you know, Nurazana, he was a really highly uh, rated rook, uh, recruit coming in. He was out for the year. You know, they could have had one of the best backcourts in the history of the NEC if those two guys were healthy. You pair them with E.J. Reed and Landon Atterbury. That's one dynamic front court. But I just don't know if they have enough bodies to compete. You know, Jack Perry's going to have to play a lot of zone, and they're going to have to win a lot of games, 80 to 75, you know, 85 to 80. And I don't know if that's going to be terribly sustainable over the course of the 16-game regular season. And, you know, if that's the case, then they're going to have to win three road games in a row, and that's very difficult to do. Okay, so of the other teams that we haven't named, is there a sleeper in there, somebody that can contend or maybe win a playoff game or two that we haven't mentioned yet? I guess, you know, a lot depends on the health of Evan Kelly, but I, I think Sacred Heart has a chance because they have the guard play. You know, they have Phil Gaetano running the point. We talked about Chris Evans. Uh, you know, Steve Gloviak is hitting a ton of threes once again. Um, you know, I, th I think they could possibly be a factor. They have to get their front court play in line, but, you know, if Davon Barnett steps up, they could be a really interesting team. All right, so let's, um, let's talk about when we get to March, three days in March, who's it going to be? Who's going to hoist, hoist that trophy? Well, I, I went out on a limb kind of in, uh, in my preview on Monday, and I said that, uh, the two teams that would be standing in the NEC title game are two teams that have never been to the NCAA tournament in Bryant and St. Francis in New York. So um, I'm going to go with that pick right now. I think I think those two teams will be standing at the end. You know, Robert Morris and Wagner will certainly be a factor, and I would never count them out. But right now I think my pick would be Bryant. All right. There it goes, Bulldog fans. Ian Peters picked you. The <laughs> onus is out. He's put it out there now. Um, as we start the season – uh, this week, any games out there that you're looking forward to the most this year? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, just just look at this weekend. You know, Robert Morris goes back to Bryant in that rematch. You know, the the second to last game of the regular season last year that decided the regular season championship. That's gonna be a fun game to watch in Smithfield. You know, next week uh, Wagner at the Mount, the first TV game. That's gonna be a really fun game. Kind of contrasting styles. You have a really good defense in Wagner and a high powered offense in the Mount. It'll be fun to see those two teams battle. And then the last game of the year on March 1st, Robert Morris is at Wagner. You know, that could be a big-time game. That could decide home court advantage in the first round of the playoffs. That could decide regular season championship. That's going to be a fun one as well. I put that one on TV. I'm a smart guy, right? I hope so. <laughs> yes, that, that's that's a good one to put on TV. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we have it's starting up this weekend. We're, uh, we're already starting up tomorrow. We already have the first... Uh, First part of the Battle of Brooklyn, LIU and St. Francis, Brooklyn playing tomorrow night. As Brian mentioned, we have Robert Morris and Bryant on Saturday. Also, St. Francis, Brooklyn at Mount St. Mary's on Saturday. So we're starting off with a bang. Um, I'm, I'm real excited about league play starting. I love the non-conference season, but everything kind of changes once you hit league play. The intensity goes up. The interest level goes up with our fans. And um, I can't wait to get out there to the games. I know I'm going to see you. Next uh, Thursday, down at the Mount, Wagner at the Mount will be on um, NEC TV, on MSG Network, and Fox College Sports uh, next Thursday night. And um, maybe we'll put you, uh, we'll give you a little spot on TV, Ryan. How about that? Is that okay? Uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'd, I'd love to be alongside Dave Popkin. <laughs> <laughs> you see, too bad, John. John, your your partner in crime there couldn't make it today. I love talking to both you guys. Um, if you haven't caught a glimpse of the Big Apple Buckets blog, you have to sample it. It is the best blog out there in mid-major hoops. I say that because it is true. 
it is not it does not just cover uh, NEC. They cover the MAC, they cover the Patriot League, they cover the Ivy League, all the mid majors, and um, they do it in a unique way. And uh, John Templon is amassing an empire over there as he gets writers to defect from other blogs. He's 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 building it up there, and I love what you guys are doing, and I love the coverage that you give to the NEC. Um, it's a real been a real boon to the conference the last few years, and uh, I got to thank you and John for that. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate that. It's it's a lot of fun to cover the league, and you know I'm I'm very grateful for you know the conference giving us coverage like you and and Ralph are doing, and then also to all the coaches. They've been they've been really open, and willing to give give us their time and talk to us about the NEC and the teams in, in general. So, and it's been a lot of fun interacting with fans on Twitter. So. John and I are having a blast, and uh, we're looking forward to another great season. Absolutely. Follow Ryan Peters at Pioneer underscore Pride. You can follow me at NEC Hoops Ron. And, uh, Ryan, thanks for joining us. I'm sure we'll talk again throughout the season. We'll get you on um, you and, and hopefully John on a couple more hangouts this year, and uh, we'll see you at the games. Sounds good, Ron. All right, thanks, everybody. Today's Google Hangout has been bought, brought to you by Geico, 15 15- Minutes could save you 15% on your car insurance. Please visit geico.com. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you next week with another NEC Men's Basketball Google Hangout. Have a good night.